Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Joel Rosen and today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a patient that I have coming in to see me. I wanted to do an actual case study with you guys and I wanted to be able to um, discuss to you uh, with you um, about some of the important tests that we run. So this is a 67 year old female who's given me permission to discuss her case. However, uh, I'm not going to name any names because of HIPAA compliance. Um, but basically what I wanted to do was I wanted to um, explain to you uh, some of the findings that we found. Um, initially she's presenting with me um, with idiopathic hives. So she breaks out in, in, in very severe hives. Um, and she's been diagnosed with Uticaria um, in 2001, which is an autoimmune phenomena. Um, it lasts for years, and then it goes into remission, and then it reoccurs out of no reason. And and she really hates to have to take the prednisones and the uh, and the anti-inflammatory and the immune support medication. And so she also suffers with migraine headaches, back pain, and what she thinks is fatigue and adrenal fatigue. Um, she's not sure if she has Hashimoto's. She may have been told that she did many years ago. She takes Synthroid. Um, she's also taking um, acid reflux medication. So what I first wanted to show you was what her particular uh, hormone or cortisol test looks like. And I want you to pay attention to this area right in here where we're talking about her free cortisol. And you can see that her free cortisol is... is um, somewhat high. Uh, you know, it's 137. It could be anywhere between uh, 80 to 185. So it's not doing a bad job, um, but it could probably be doing a little bit better. Um, but realize that this 24-hour free cortisol only represents about 1 to 3% of her total metabolized cortisol. So what does that mean? It means that if she uses up a certain amount of cortisol at the end of the day, that's what the metabolized cortisol is, what a terrible drawing that is, um, then, then that's how much she has available to use for the entire day. So I kind of use the analogy, that's how much she, money she has spent at the end of the day. And you can see she should be spending somewhere between $2,750 and $5,400. And she's only using $2,833. So it tells, it answers the question, how much um, cortisol does this patient have to meet her day-to-day -day, um, requirements? And you can see she is starting to flatline. Um, what's so great about the Dutch test is it would never have showed us, um, if we did a saliva sample, her total metabolized cortisol. It would only show us her 24-hour free cortisol, and that's what's tested in the saliva. So it answers the question, um, She, uh, how much is she spending at any one moment in time? So I kind of use the analogy, this amount represents what you have in your wallet right now, what you're able to spend on on, on anything that you want or what you're able to use to meet your demands of stress. Whereas this one says at the end of the day, how much did you utilize at the end of the day? So if you're making conclusions on 24 hour free cortisol and saying, well, she's kind of high um, or she, she could use a little bit of help, but you know what? She's also racy because you really want to correlate it to the symptoms. If she was racy, wired or tired, I may want to suggest giving her something to, to reduce her cortisol because she is close to the top and she she has the symptomatic um, feedback of being racy, um, yet if I didn't realize that her total metabolized cortisol was low and I gave her something to settle her down and reduce her cortisol levels, we're going to flatline her even further. So that was one interesting observation, meaning you need to take into consideration how much is someone utilizing, how much are they able to get through the entire day, and how much do they have at any one moment? Because they're not always going to be equal. And I always say, if this dial is turned down and this dial is turned up, you're not going to realize that on a 24-hour um, a free cortisol saliva test. You need to do a 24-hour free um, urinary test. And what that means is you're you're taking urinary samples at four different times during the day. You're doing it at nighttime, you're, well, just before dinner. You're doing it at bedtime. You're doing it at, at when you first wake up. And you're doing it two hours later. And you can see in her case, 
she is looking very nicely. She is fitting. She's waking up with the um, right amount of cortisol. She says she does very well in the morning, and you can see she gets a nice spike two hours later, but she tells me she crashes in the middle of the afternoon, and you can see that huge, huge drop. It's actually below where it should be, and that correlates really, really nicely with what she says she's experiencing, and she has some blood sugar issues. She's waiting too long to eat, and that's causing her cortisol levels to tank. And that's one of the reasons you can see her metabolized cortisol is being used up is she is just going for too long a time throughout the day where she's not getting any nutrients, her blood sugar starts to fall, and your body senses that as a cortisol response or it senses that as a stress response and says, hey, this is a stressful situation. We have no energy. We got to release a little cortisol. And then done repeatedly day in, day out, day in, day out, ultimately that is going to cause that person to crash. Now what we like to do is we actually like to look at the relationship between how much total cortisol someone is using on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So we can see that in her case she should be between 400 to 2500 and she is at 484. So what I tell patients is she is starting to get into a pregnenolone steal. And what that basically means is, is that you have sort of cortisol on one side and you have, um, you have DHEA on the other side. And above that you have pregnenolone. And pregnenolone can go this way or it can go this way. Well, let's see. And, or it could go this way this way. And what happens is when we've had acute stress responses, then you start to block the delivery of pregnenolone to DHEA and it starts to help cortisol production. So I tell patients you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And what we can see is we can see the result of that because she is starting to see a decrease in her total DHEA. And she is also seeing a decrease in her total cortisol. So it's not enough anymore that she is robbing Peter to pay Paul because both these tanks are starting to fall. However, she is still doing a good job in her freed cortisol. So it doesn't necessarily mean just because she's running dry on her tanks in her cortisol being utilized for the entire day and her DHEA, she is being able to keep up with her day-to-day -day demands of stress. It's just at the end of the day, she's running on empty towards the end of the day and she's not replenishing her reserves based on her total cortisol and her DHEA. So she is still keeping up with her demand. However, I would say she's looking at about a stage five, meaning DHEA and cortisol are still decreased, but her rhythm is still there. And you'll see with patients who still have a little bit of rhythm, you'll see that they're still within the ranges. So they get up in the morning, they get a nice surge, although she crashes in the middle of the day, and then she kind of is tired at nighttime. When you see someone who has had a prolonged stress response, they tend to tank the whole way down. So stage seven would be this is low, this is low, this is low, and this is low. Whereas something like a stage five is this is low, this is low. She's being able to keep up with her free cortisol and she is continuing to have a good circadian rhythm. Also, what's great about this test is it looks at her total estrogen with its eight metabolites, which I'm not going to discuss on this particular um, sample, and it also talks about her progesterone, and then lastly, it tells me about her testosterone. So those are really, really great things. But what I wanted to talk to you about is, is what is dragging her down? That's the real solution. Is It's like, okay, we can give her DHEA, we can give her some cortisol, but what's really dragging this patient down? Remember I said she had an autoimmunity? And so 80% of a person's immune system is in their gut. And so what we did is we did a test called the wheat zoomer. And the wheat zoomer, what it does is it looks at her, um, her antibodies or her leaky gut. And you can see in this particular instance that she is starting to have um, some total IgA um, go a little bit elevated. So her immune system is getting somewhat stressed. However, she's been gluten-free for a while, and you can see some of these antibodies to the constituents that hold the cell wall together are starting to be registered. So I, tell, I told her that she has some signs of leaky gut in that we are seeing some of the components or protein structures that hold the wall together 
they're starting to be determined uh, entering into the bloodstream then we do a weak germ panel a gliadin panel and you can see that she's reacting to alpha gliadin and beta gliadin and, or sorry gamma gliadin these are the peptide structures found in wheat and a lot of the times LabCorp will only test alpha gliadin IgA if that were the case we would have told her hey guess what you're not reacting to gluten because you're, not, you're, you're negative however she's been off of gluten for some time and you can still see she has some reactivity um, then we do the glutenin panel this is another protein sort of sticky like substance in the in the um, in the gluten and she's reacting to that as well one last really important sign is the transglutaminase transglutaminase 3 and transglutaminase 6 of which she is reacting to both transglutaminase 3 is found in the skin and transglutaminase 6 is found in the, in the nervous system and she has some moderate risks although she's been off of gluten for some time so she needs to be off of gluten not only because she has some leakiness in her gut not only because she has some reactivity to gliadin but also because she has reactivity to um, the transglutaminase 3 and 6 which is against your skin tissue and your brain tissue going back to here we can see that her gut and the food reactivities that she's eating or getting reactions to is causing her cortisol demand to be wiped out day in day out the last thing we did was we did a, um, a Cyrex test and the Cyrex test is the cross reactivity test so what this answers is okay we realize you're reacting to gluten you have some leakiness of your gut you need to be off of gluten but are you reacting to the other peptides and you can see she is equivocal in rye, barley, spelt, Polish wheat. So I would tell her for the next six months, those things need to be off of your plate. However, the really good news is, is that she is not reacting to um, any of these foods. So you can see dairy, oats, yeast, coffee, soy, egg, corn. So she's not reacting to any of those. So I tell patients, anything that's positive is positive, which means that you need to get that off your plate. Anything that's equivocal means that it's getting close to being positive, and I usually recommend getting off of that for about six months. However, if it's negative, it's a good sign. It just doesn't mean it's 100% negative. And what do I mean by that? Realize that this is testing your IgG and your IgA components, which means if you react to some kind of food peptide by producing an antibody, you'll produce an antibody through an immunoglobin G or an immunoglobin A. However, that doesn't mean that you don't necessarily have some kind of reaction, albeit um, a non-antibody reaction to these foods, meaning you could still be reacting through a complementary system to these foods, but because you didn't produce an antibody to it, then, then you didn't test positive. So what does that mean? It means that we put patients on six-week cleanses, and after six weeks, we remove all of these foods and then we reintroduce them, whether she reacted to them or not. That way, we can reduce the complementary system reactivity in the body so that when we reintroduce, say, oats, we want to measure her response. We want to measure her response in terms of, does she have any um, reactivity, subjective complaints, gas, boating, bloating, nausea, um, pain, constipation, diarrhea, heart palpitations, itchiness in her skin, brain fog, because if she does, there's a good chance that she's possibly reacting to these particular foods. Um, so that's a really good question to, to answer. Um, hopefully you got a lot, about, a lot of this out of this presentation today, and um, I, I 